you are a pediatric occupational therapist and you've specialized in sensory processing disorder. We've, we've definitely got a lot of parents that, that can do with your support and your advice. I think you've got a very fitting name for what you do, Sarah Appleman. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you choose your profession according to your surname or did it just... Definitely not. <laughs> so yes, my son was diagnosed pretty early. Uh, he had like high rigidity um, in his tone. He was unable to do certain movements. He cried all the time. It was a, it was a difficult first child. You know, you take all your courses thinking like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that whole natural birthing and then no. <laughs> going back after I think it was about he was probably about a year old and change and we noticed all these difficulties and we took him to a pediatric neurologist and they said it's possible he had like a stroke in utero and he had mm -hmm. some sensory integration things as a result so feeding was always a tough thing clothing mm -hmm. was tough you know I could literally relate to parents because I was both a therapist at that point and now had a child who had allergies and you know you list all the things off <laughs> but it, but it's good because you can give practical advice and you can say listen i've been there i've gone through it all and these are the things that work these are the things that didn't work and just for parents with kids with sensory processing disorder it's it's lovely for them to meet somebody like you i think yeah thank you it's it is really interesting because i've been doing it for 21 years now knowing what they need and mm -hmm. how to help reach them because it's not always what we expect or what we mm. want as parents and we have to or, or therapists like what you expect to get out of a session may not happen and go you have to be flexible and understand right now this is what my child needs and it's yes. going to vary from the norm mm. and that's okay but speaking about the activities i think it's very important for parents to also know that they can do certain things that are household chores like baking you're just speaking about baking or just other fun activities and they can bring in a lot of the concepts that their children need to work on um, which we can definitely touch on but i want to backtrack and just go back to sensory processing disorder because it is a relatively known term now but i think still like when you're a new parent you don't think of oh does my child perhaps have spd and I wanted to ask you, because you specialize in it, what are some of the signs that parents can look out for at a young age? Our sensory processing, what it basically, because it could be like a four day lecture. <laughs> so <I'm gonna> <laughs> Let's <it>. start. <laughs> <laughs> as best as I can. But uh, basically our senses are for survival. And if you mm. think about it, you go outside and without thinking about that process, you're doing things. So mm. if you're about to cross the street and you hear a car screeching, right? Mm. If you go, and I always give the example because it's so relatable that if you go into the food store and you purchase milk and then you get home, you know you just purchased it. What's the first thing you do before you pour it in? I know the answer because I watched your one interview on San Diego News. Yeah. You smell it. <laughs> you smell it. And that is what every everybody does right like yeah. without thinking about it you open yeah. it up like that mm. why why do we do all of these things and the basic thing is survival that's mm. what the purpose is so is an infant you do uh, reflexes and things to, to help survive yes. uh, being a helpless baby so if your brain is in misinterpreting that information and and saying hey this is dangerous but it's mm. really not Okay, so we all have someone we know, let's say that wears too much perfume and we don't want to hug them because then we're going to smell like them, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the you know, older generation. So you're like going to start avoiding like, no, no, it's okay, both the pools, you know, fist bump, yes. right? you know, like, <laughs> but why? Perfect. Because that, you're like, oh, and you smell it all day, right? Like mm. there are things that you will naturally avoid, little things. So mm. certain restaurants, if you don't like the smell of certain things. Uh, textured clothing, like people, mm. kids who love t-shirts and shirt, you know, and they're running around and then they come full time and they have to put the jackets or the sweaters and you yeah. can just see them. So Fringe. if any of your senses, which we learn about our sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing, misinterpret information, 
that's going to be a sensory processing problem. So mm. everybody has it to a norm where it doesn't interfere with your daily skills. Mm. But if you have it that it's disturbing, a noise in the classroom is not allowing you to pay attention to the teacher because you're focusing on that garbage truck three blocks away yes. versus, um, you know, a, a light touch of someone taps you and then you go mm. into full meltdown because you did not like that. That was mm. translated as too much noxious like information. If if that happens and you see your child and you're trying to understand why, that's a sensory problem right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, they cover their ears. Uh, the light is too bright. Right. They don't, they gag when they're eating certain mm -hmm. things. But, and then the other thing I say is that there's two systems they don't teach to kindergarten children. So one is vestibular and the other is pro. So I tell parents all the time, the kids who are quiet on the side at playground make me as just as concerned as a child who's running and jumping off that slide. Mm -hmm. They're both something to watch because if that yes. child displays poor balance, poor coordination, mm -hmm. the timing isn't right. They're gonna just sit in the sandbox and not you know, mm -hmm. play. But that, you need to have that. I'm not saying every kid has to go on a playground. I'm saying they have to have the ability to negotiate, navigate on a playground yes. should that come because that's life. Getting yes. on and off, Obstacle escalators. Yes, um, of course. Yes, memory and language and processing. Mm. So there's a lot of steps for it. It's so important. I mean, I see it with all of our kids that we work with. And it, it's really good that it, there is such a focus on it now. It's even in the DSM-5. If you've realized as a parent, okay, my child might be displaying some of these SPD signs, what do parents do? They, they should go and see an occupational therapist. I would yeah, say. So normally you would tell, um, cause I've actually done a lot of lectures to help um, doctors become more aware mm. of the situation because you know, a lot of them still, you know, a lot of people would, when I first became a therapist would say like, oh, OT, OT. And now all of a sudden they're hearing the progress and they're making, oh wait, there is something to it. You know, it used to be very strict, like, no, you have to do, you know, one type of, uh, you know, let's say it was ABA and no, you have to do trial, trial, yes. trial. And then I started working a lot with closely with ABA professionals. And we said, this is a joint team effort. One is not better than the other. They should all work mm -hmm. PT, OT, speech, ABA. Or, you know, special ed, all of it, mm -hmm. psychologists, everybody has to work on that same page to help this child. It's such an important point there because most of us were trained in ABA. We, we stepped away a bit and we started collaborating with autistic adults to create a holistic support system. But with the ABA, I remember clearly in my training where the supervisor would say, you just got to flood the kid with some of the sensory input. And it was against what I wanted to do. But um, with with our kids, you can't flood them. And, you know, sometimes desensitization could work, but it is. And I think I, I heard one of your podcasts with Penny Williams, where you spoke about, yes, desensitization work, but you need to also include their interest. You need to make it fun for them because... Otherwise, what, what is the point? Like you also said, we all have things that we don't like and we're allowed not to like it. But now because of our kid doesn't like, um, you know, maybe a food that his sibling or her sibling likes, then we just say, no, you got to push through, you got to eat it. You're a hundred percent correct. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying take every single child and throw them on a trampoline and expect a miracle. Like I always tell parents, I'm like, it's organized chaos. You know, there's a purpose. I don't say get on and, and jump for 20 minutes and then, oh, your kid is fine. I'm like, no, 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 no. They have to do heavy work. They have to do movement. They have to do organization. There has to be a purpose for them to go. So like if mm -hmm. yesterday with this parent, I was like, have them jump on the couch cushions, climb up over that chair, you know, crash mm -hmm. into the pad and then run and get a matching Lego piece from what you just did. And yes. they have to look, remember, retain, and then stack. And this mm -hmm. little boy, I told you, it was the first time I saw him, he was trying to say, like, we took a break from it. And I said, free play, you know, go take a minute to yourself. We'll set up the next activity. And he came over and he went, Apabada. And we were like, what? Aww, and then he, he goes, Ap Apical. And I'm like, she was trying to think he says, I said, no, I think he's saying obstacle course. Yeah. And we said obstacle course and he nodded. And I'm like, <laughs> he, for the first time knew 
that pattern was very calming and organizing for him. Uh, step one, step two, step three, come back. Yes, yeah. that self-regulation. That is one of the yes. ultimate goals, right? Is we, yes. we want to first provide that input for our kids and then ultimately get them so self-aware that they say, okay, well, I, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need to push something, squeeze something. I need to pull exactly. something or punch something, exactly. not someone. Not someone, <laughs> yeah. So we, and there are kids that I love that because when they realize, like you said, that self-regulation piece is mm. huge. It's, it's mm. parents, you know, and I have a lot of parents out there like, I tell the kids, I was early on, um, they're 10 months old or 11 months old. And I'm like, no, leave them and just mm. go step away and then come back and smile. And if they cry, you'll reassure them that they can handle it. But if you don't yes. start that early, three, mm. four, five years old, it's very difficult to, mm. to Exactly. And that fosters independence. And that's also another thing that parents are always looking out for for later is that they want their child to be as independent as possible. You wrote a book, you wrote two books, Paw Prints, which I really <laughs> like. I really like the idea of including animals in, in any type of session or interaction with kids. Um, and then I've, I saw some of your free worksheets that you have which is great for parents that they can include in the house. Um, and then your second book, Play With Food, which I also like the story about that you yeah. named it Play With Food because everyone always says, don't play with your food. Yeah, so I actually had a, um, the, a woman reach out through like LinkedIn yeah. and it was so funny because she was like, uh, I don't understand. What is play with your food? <laughs> but she was an older lady. It was very sweet. And I said, I, I completely understand as a child, I was not allowed to play with mm. my food. However, this is a therapeutic uh, activity based and, and cookbook to assist yes. children who have a decreased food repertoire. We had children come over and the parents would go call me or text me the next day like, what's this pepper game? Because my child oh, is awesome. And I said, do just cut up different colored peppers. Close your mm. eyes because then it's a surprise instead of you have to eat your pepper. Mm. It's close your eyes. Oh, look, you won. You're right. It was a yellow pepper. Woo. -hoo. And then they're yeah. like, yeah, you get to eat the rest of that pepper. It's see, it's that mentality mm. of not, if you don't it's, eat it, yeah. you don't get dessert or you have to go to Fact, your room. Yeah. Take that out yes. and put it on their plates and get them. So it's, it really is trying to teach them to be active participants in mm. the process of making the food setting. And I tell parents, I'm like, they don't want to even be in the kitchen. Start simple, set mm. the table. They mm. know it's getting done. Set the table, that heavy plates and passing it out. Uh, yes. And then just have them slice things that don't have a scent. So it could be mm. fruit, it could be vegetables. Obviously you're going to monitor them and make sure they're properly you know, of age that they mm. can do that. Yes. Uh, and then you start mixing. They could pour things and mix and doing all of that. They start to slowly integrate the scents instead of walking in mm. and you smell the food. You know, it's a slower process. You're including and incorporating so many other concepts. So you're actually working on academics. You're working on turn taking. There's a lot of conversation going on, even if it is through an AAC device. Um, you can you can include so many different things. We've got, uh, with AIMS, we've got activity maps where we just take a simple activity like creating a lava lamp and we can include collaboration, which can lead to social interaction. You can do uh, academics, you can do colors and shapes and all those things. And with baking and cooking, it's the same thing. So you're teaching them how to cut, you're teaching them how to share, you're teaching them how to wait their turn. But there are so many different things and I think for parents when they get home you know from a long day of work they might not think that they want to go and sit down and now work on their child's sensory processing challenges but if you think about it and they can take your book and they can do a few activities and it covers it because now they've already made made dinner and that's that's the best part is I have things in here that are so simple, you know, like sides, like a simple steak or a chicken or soup. So if you have a crock pot or something that you want to just, you know, use, that's fine. And I tell parents that like at the, the thing was at the beginning of the book, like, you know, it says from me, like at the beginning, it literally says like, I am not a trained chef. Yeah. Don't don't come after me for this is not a healthy cookbook because, you know, you have yeah. to be so you get attacked from all different. I'm like, yeah. I'm not a trained chef. I am not a health, this is for purposeful stuff. You can feel free if you have better recipes or you want to alter yeah, oil it. for applesauce, yeah. gluten-free, yeah. yes. go right ahead. Yes. I'm fine with all of that because mm. you could simply replace it with all the gluten-free stuff that they didn't have 
when I was growing up. And so I had someone from uh, the Hamptons send me a picture. Her son is diagnosed with autism and he was he's 19. And they sent pictures of him making a stew, uh, you know, this past one. And it was, and the whole family ate it. So he, you could yeah, see he's proud. it and do it. And yeah, and he was mm. proud. And again, like you said, we're teaching self-care skills. We're teaching mm. independent living. So yeah. there's something for like from three to 20 in the book. Mm. Um, and that, uh, yeah, that is something, I mean, obviously we want our kids, like I said earlier, to be as independent as possible. And that would include to make their own food. So it's something that you can start young and you're working on the sensory processing part, but you're also working on independence for them to understand that they can, they can do their own thing. And if they want a particular snack and then you're going into self-regulation again, and if they want a particular snack, if it's a bit crunchy, they can make that themselves. And what would you say if a child is really not interested at all? and he's only eating chicken nuggets or something specific, how would you get a child like that to a child that they're actually participating in creating and, and making the food with you and eating it? Yeah, so that's, that's some of the stuff is you want to transition, like chicken nuggets are crunchy, you know, mm. like they have that little bit. So you want to get them going towards a healthier choice. So I have fun things that we prepare. Like I try to do free things for parents because I know I try to help as many as I can. So like I started this TikTok thing. I <laughs> Did TikTok. you? <laughs> and then I try to share it through Instagram or LinkedIn, mm. you know, just to help as many people like, oh, I didn't think of that. Where, you know, it's, mm. it's presentation. So if you think about it, you know, and you give your child, they know their chicken nuggets expected, it's fine. But if we slowly transition out of that and you could give them as a snack before, you know, carrots, celery, and then you give them different healthy choices like the hummus or the, you know, um, dips, ranch, like something else that you could get that crunch out of. Mm -hmm. And if they're set on chicken nuggets, instead of buying chicken nuggets, you I have it. in there, make the chicken nuggets mm, with them so they get that brilliant. process yes. and if they don't like to be dirty i had a child that i was working on and he didn't like to be dirty so we started to use a fork to dip it and then you know dip it in the egg and yeah. the crumbs into the and put on a plate and then they watched mm. it you know that process like okay if you want this we have to just start so mm. you don't just say you have to do you show them the steps and maybe they'll start with just the flour and then you'll take over that's actually a very good point because if if you have a child and he wants a specific snack like let's say let's take the example of a chicken nugget you can always do on a visual schedule show him okay on fridays you get the real chicken nuggets on mondays or on wednesdays we make our own chicken nuggets um and then you slowly get them part of the process and you can even make it like a little competition whose chicken nuggets is the best is it mcdonald's or ours mm -hmm. i think also that idea of creating something and then eating your own creation is yes. is fun for kids because they see oh okay i actually made this and it's it doesn't taste too bad uh, yeah and it does have a better taste and it it's yes. fresh there's something but mm -hmm. you know like you have all the parents always tell me my kid eats the carbs right like it's you yeah. know pretzels chips french mm -hmm. fries and and the chicken nuggets and i'm like but what happens is with our body, if you think about everything's connected, right? What we eat, how we digest, how we sleep and our energy, it's all connected. So if you're giving your child that ability to just eat those things, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. So yes, I used to have a schedule, right? Morning, this is what we're doing, lunch, the activities in between. And then I also had to say, what's for dinner okay we're gonna do this mm. oh we don't like that what's our alternative for that instead of making four different dinners or mm. you know how i could combine something um as a giver but it's very important to show them other options so instead of chips you know different vegetables different mm. fruits different yeah. just slowly and if kids have only bland they like visually only certain things slowly change that too so if you slice a banana and then you put cut grapes on the side, you know, just so mm -hmm. that they can see, you can make a caterpillar, you can make, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, be creative with it. And then they'll start changing how they visual. But if we say, no, my kid only eats brown foods and or neutral color foods, mm -hmm. but you gotta, you gotta start. You gotta try. Yes. Try. 
Yeah. yeah, my friend Dan, he's uh, an autistic adult and an advocate. He always says, but practice makes progress. Most of our clients are in remote areas. They don't always have access to an occupational therapist that has experience with sensory processing disorders. And I know that you do Zoom calls, but for yeah. parents, that, that would be amazing if some of the parents can utilize that service. But for the parents who can't, and they're just at home and they really don't have any extra support what would you say some of the tips that you would share with them if they have a child with spd i mean that's that's that for granted um living in wherever you live that you can have access to your doctor and to and that's that's why i wrote this actually because i've had people say you gotta write this down i wish i had this my kid is now 30 and i wish i had that when i was mm. you know when he was younger and to bomb because as a parent that's one of our things is we want to know that we're helping our child and we want the child to come to us and love and before they're independent like that's that's very special so mm -hmm. if you have a child who then sees that you're providing them with what they feel and need mm -hmm. and then they feel independent and grow from it that's that's very mm -hmm. very good so these kids that i've been working with have definitely my own son my, my daughter and you know it's it's the kids i've worked with for all these years I want to share my findings with as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. So that's why the website is has a lot of free videos okay. that we just started making. Uh, it's playwithyourfoodbook.com. Okay. And then we have um, the Instagram is playwithyourfoodbook. Mm -hmm. And TikTok, I think it's my name. I think it's Sarah Bowen. I don't know. <laughs> I, can't, I <laughs> can't wait to go and check out your TikTok. All of these things that I'm trying yes. to do that are free. There's no exactly. payment. It's, so it's good. just to help them so that they learn. Yeah. But some of the things that I, the trick that I show what this baby I'm working with who really doesn't eat. Mm -hmm. So I told the mom, we're going to be doing our exercises at 10 months old. So I show mm -hmm. her supported, you know, with a wheelbarrow walk, rolling, yeah. having to lift, you know, Mm. Uh, age appropriate exercises and mm. i texted her i said she's like oh we didn't get to the feeling i said i guarantee when i leave she's going to be hungry let me know and like 10 minutes i already get a text like she ate everything you know <laughs> so awesome. that is something that parents mm. can do if you don't have you could create an obstacle course you could create mm. exercises you could do relay races you could do scavenger hunt mm. that's where the focus get that energy get the mind and the body active Mm -hmm. and then they will be hungry without mm -hmm. even realizing put out those healthy choices or have them help prepare something fun yeah and make, then they'll eat yeah. yes and make the food pretty like little caterpillar banana and grapes yeah <laughs> i usually cut a swan out uh, mm -hmm. out of an apple um, uh, like then you could put different dipping so you could put chocolate you could put honey you could put whatever jams um yeah. i have kids making so if they don't want to touch like we cut the apple so we make prints out of also jellies and jams mm. just making pictures and then it gets on them and they lick it off you know yeah. so slowly integrating those type of things absolutely yeah i think the the last thing that i would want to say is that a lot of our kids have a comorbidity with anxiety and they they have a lot of anxiety when it comes to food and certain sensory input so it is a big thing for them and they definitely feel it more intensely than us um but they go over it in their heads they're like i don't like grapes i don't like grapes i don't like grapes and as soon as you make it into a game hey catch the grape throw grapes at your brother maybe not that but um you know <laughs> then it's like oh the grapes yeah. aren't that bad and then exactly. you know, it's by accident where they would try a grape or lick it off and they're like hmm, not that bad it's just kind of getting yeah. over that first obstacle yes and that's that's the biggest thing is a problem with anxiety that i've worked with so back in new york i used to do uh, i had animal assisted therapy and we mm. had children who were terrified of the little shih tzu and poodle shih tzu dog like little mm. nothings that were trained mm. and we had them working and playing and by the end you could see so i'd first say oh you're not going to uh, have to touch or go near the dog, throw the ball away and, yeah. you know, play fetch. And that was fun. The dog would bring it back. And then I'm like, oh no, look, we would have like a vest made and we would put like a Velcro and pretend the dogs have bugs and they had to use tweezers <laughs> okay. to pick it up. So, right. Like, so yeah. integrating, like you're saving mm. the dog. Oh, look, he's so happy because you saved the dog. <laughs> and then that would break all of that up. Yeah. It's the same concept now when yeah. you're feeding and working with food it's very personal you're putting mm. something in your mouth and like i said that mm. digestion it's it's 
oh God, I don't like this. I'm sick. I'm in danger. I don't know. Mm. Oh, you know, your body's not going to be okay. Versus when you have your favorite comforting foods. Mm. So if you could change and shift that by, you know what? You don't like grapes. You don't have to eat grapes, but I want to make this dessert for your sibling, your mm. parent, your caregiver. Can you help me just put this here? This So now they're touching it, but they yeah. know they don't have to eat it. We'll start to desensitize them because mm. that's what it is, desensitization. Yeah. Exactly, and in a fun in a fun way, I think that's the most important thing. That mm -hmm. same concept, if children are like, you have to eat, this is what you're eating, mm -hmm. that anxiety and that fear is a hundred percent there, and it does yeah. cycle through. So you have to put it out. Yeah. You know what? You're gonna serve it to everybody, but you don't have to eat it. Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna everyone gets it on their plate, but you still don't have to eat it just to visually get yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I just finished watching uh, the last season of Atypical, and they depicted really well oh, there. Where I uh, love that I'm show. I just watched it too. <laughs> where Sam is also like he doesn't he likes a specific food, and it is an anxiety provoking idea thought for him to think, oh, I need to start varying my food choices. But as soon as it, the reason was that he wanted to go to Antarctica. Then it was like, okay, I'll try it. And it was his idea. So it's also it's that combination of desensitization with an interest and making it fun and not put, putting so much pressure on it. Like you have to do this. If you eat five grapes, then you can go and play your iPad. I don't think that that, that should be the way that we work with our kids at all. Right. Anyways. I'll tell you what, why I love that show so much. <laughs> it was brilliant. If you want to see a sensory meltdown, right? Yes. When he got this leather jacket, oh, his friend, with the zippers, with the zipper, that. and then like the the crinkling, mm. and he's in school and he's trying to focus, but every time he moved and it crinkled, and you yes. watch that was so brilliantly Accurate. portrayed yes. because you're like, what's the big deal? It crinkles because to us with a typical developing sensory system, mm. that sounds becomes background because our brain yes. says this is unimportant. Yes. Don't listen to it. But for him, it's every time it's it's overwhelming. Again, again, mm. and again, and again, and it just keeps building until he just takes it off and throws it out. Like, yes. But thank you so much for chatting. It was really lovely to meet you. <laughs> no, thank you so much for the invitation. It was my pleasure. It was very lovely meeting you. And I think we definitely discussed some interesting topics. <laughs>